Okay, so I've got that ready to go. Yeah, um, you can go ahead. I'll, and do I'll the share my screen so sure. that you can make sure that you can everyone you can see yeah. that. Yes. Um, so can everyone see the? Um, I'm not sure if that's. We can see. We can see it. That's fine. Uh, yes, Rachel, if, you could, uh, if you could close the slide layout. Yeah. That would be uh, probably better. Trying to, I think I've got to share a different, it's a different actual yeah. screen. Yeah. It's sharing the background, not the yeah. show. That's the one I want, I think. Is that the right one? Yeah, um, that looks like the right one. Yes, this is perfect. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Okay, okay. everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you all today for this is our International Women's Day 2021 um, special postgraduate seminar meeting um, and welcome you on behalf of the study of the religions department but also our colleagues at Women's Studies at UCC. Um, Dr. Dusandi has asked me to, um, to chair this meeting. We, we normally have our postgraduate meeting at this time of day but we are so delighted that we've got Professor Shabana Mir um, from the American Islamic College in Chicago, who's going to be speaking to us today. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background, let me bring up my notes. Um, Dr. Uh, sorry, I should say, uh, um, Associate Professor um, Shabana Mir is also the Director of Undergraduate Studies at the American Islamic College in Chicago. She wrote the nationally award-winning book, Muslim American Women on Campus, Undergraduate Social Life and Identity, which was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2014. And it's based on her ethnographic research on Muslim college students after September 11. Shabana has lived, studied and taught in the US, the UK and Pakistan. She has written academic chapters, journal articles, children's literature, a blog, and of course her book. She is an international public speaker on gender, religion, education and politics, and she's a very engaged Twitter participant. Um, if you can follow her, I do highly recommend it because that's how I think I've, I've really come to know um, Shivana through Twitter, although this is the first time we've actually managed to speak face to face. Um, and she's going to talk to us a little bit today about the experiences of Muslim American women on campus. And I know from my own research looking at Muslim women in Australia, um, I think probably one of the most underestimated experiences is the double bind that Muslim women face. So it's not just sexism that um, Muslim women face in the broader environment that all women are exposed to, um, but also sexism within the Muslim community, but the double bind of Islamophobia on top of that. Mm -hmm. So the experience of speaking out as Muslim women in regards to the sexism they face brings with it the double scrutiny that um, is often attributed to um, Islam as being the cause of their sexism. Um, and while it might often be the case that religious-based um, uh, religious sexism is problematic, um, the, the prejudice and the racism that exists in terms of uh, attributing um, everything solely to their religious identity or to um, the Muslim men that, that are in the community and the stigmatisation that goes along with that really proposes a double bind for Muslim women. So I'm really delighted to, to have Professor Mir um, speak to us today because I think it's going to be some, really illuminating to get um, her perspective. Um, uh, certainly the experience of Muslims in America is a little bit more developed, I suppose you'd say, in terms of the research that's been done than Muslims here in Ireland. So we've got a lot to learn from you. Um, I'm going to be controlling the slides today. so. Um, uh, I'm going to hand this over now to, to Professor Mia, but when you want me to move on to the next slide, just give me a little a little buzz or a little um, sign um, and, um, and I'll hand it over to you, Professor Mia. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction uh, and thank you for welcoming me to uh, UCC Cork. Uh, I feel like I'm in Ireland and I wish I was there, uh, but uh, we'll have to make do uh, with this for now. Uh, I want to thank um, my friend Amanala Desandi uh, for inviting me. Uh, to do this uh, presentation, and I want to thank also the De UCC Department of Religion and Women's Studies um, for uh, also sponsoring uh, this event. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, Muslim American Women on Campus, Undergraduate Social Life uh, and Identity, uh, and I'm going to be drawing upon uh, some of the stories 
uh, of Muslim women undergraduates uh, that I recorded uh, during my ethnographic research. Um, so um, um, one of the things that when we uh, do any kind of anthropological or sociological work uh, that we learn is that whatever is possible for us, the choices that are possible for us, uh, the opportunities that are possible for us are, are always shaped by the historical moment and the political moment uh, within which we live. And I have an immigrant story that illustrates this. My father's brother um, was in his late teens when he moved to the United States. He was a tennis player and he uh, immigrated to the United States in the 1950s. Uh, this is, of course, long before the Islamic Revolution in Iran, before the Soviet invasion of uh, Afghanistan uh, and the rise of um, sort of political Islam uh, in the world um, at large. Uh, so when my uh, uncle uh, arrived in the deep south in the United States, he was the only foreigner and the only Muslim for miles around. So he was a novelty wherever he went. This is the 1950s. Uh, and for the most part, Americans didn't really know that there was a Pakistan, right? So he was a cool, hip Pakistani student with a sports scholarship, uh, and he was known as Mo. Uh, people would see his photo in the paper, and they would um, uh, recognize him wherever he went. Oh, we know you're Mo, you're the tennis player at Clemson, right? So um, Mo um, became, you know, uh, you know, found a nice home for himself in the deep south. He started uh, dating a young woman in a farming family. He mentioned being a little <laughs> offended by the muddy boots and the rustic style of his girlfriend's family. Uh, so when he um, started dating this young woman, uh, the mother wanted to, uh, the mother of the young woman wanted to meet him. Uh, so he went to meet her and uh, she asked him, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Pakistan. And of course, as you know, at that time, most Americans didn't really know that there was a Pakistan. Uh, so she heard Palestine because she was far more familiar with the Bible than she was with the world map. Uh, so Mo adapted to being from Palestine since it was the only category available. This remains a theme through my book that many of us adapt to the category available, whatever category is available to us, we often choose to occupy it. Creating new categories or um, redefining ourselves is hard work if your interlocutor has no category for you. If your interlocutor has no category that's home for you, you have to make one. And it's a lot easier just to fit into the category that your interlocutor already has. So when Nancy's mother asked Mo what religion he was, he tried to explain. But uh, 1950s teenagers uh, from westernized families in Pakistan were not very knowledgeable about Islam. This happened later, right? So uh, Nancy's mother said, okay, so Islam, is that like Catholics? And he said, oh, no. And, and Nancy's mother said, you can date her then. Now, this sounds strange to you, but if you know anything about the Deep South in the United States and anti-Catholic prejudice there, this makes total sense. Even today, Catholics remain demonized in the American South and uh, in many other American communities. But uh, if one might argue that Muslims have taken over that <laughs> hatred uh, in the present day, Mo might not have such an easy task of fitting in in a small Southern town as a Muslim from Pakistan uh, at today uh, than he had at that time. In the 1970s, Mo's nephew, immigrated and attended college in the United States. This nephew at that time then became co-founder with his wife of a new mosque in Texas and of networks that allowed him and his children to live relatively full Muslim and Pakistani lives in communities that were rapidly growing and also upwardly mobile about 20 years later. 20 more years later, Mo's niece emigrated from Pakistan and became a cultural anthropologist <laughs> interested in studying Muslim cultural adaptation in the United States. That's me. Uh, 
So most of my research participants were raised in the United States by parents who had arrived in the in the 1970s. Mo's uh, nephew around that time period. There's also a very large black community that is the largest uh, racial ethnic group uh, in the Muslim U.S. community, uh, and there are of course many converts and many um, um, uh, in the white Latinx and other communities. So. What have we learned from this little anecdote is that categories are allotted to people very often and people uh, will try to make uh, categories for themselves, but that is that takes work. Uh, today, we are in a historical moment that is not the same moment as uh, when I wrote this book. I wrote this book, uh, uh, I, I did the research for this book right after 9-11. So soon after 9-11, um, this research uh, was conducted. Uh, I wasn't planning for this research to be uh, a post 9-11 um, type research. Uh, it was supposed to be a very, <laughs> very calm uh, um, data collection. Uh, but then 9-11 happened and my research proposal simply changed. Um, so um, so yes, we don't have a 9-11 right now, but let's not congratulate ourselves because we're still in the midst of a, you know, relatively speaking, an Islamophobic war on terror conducted by the United States along with its allies. And we are also in the middle of a new surge worldwide in extremist right-wing neo-Nazi and neo-fascist organizations and recruitment. So these are rising worldwide. Uh, one of those signals was the massacre uh, in the Christchurch mosque, uh, which showed you an Australian who, who moved to New Zealand uh, uh, under the influence of a variety of different ideologues uh, in the United States and elsewhere. So you have a global network now that is recruiting uh, for uh, hatred, um, um, a race hatred uh, generally, but particularly Islamophobic um, uh, bigotry. So uh, you saw this also in the latest um, uh, drama in the United States. So in the at the highest level in the United States, you saw uh, that there was room for open espousal of previously fringe views. Uh, there was espousal before, but now there is relatively uh, open espousal. Just a, uh, a few um, days ago, you've also seen the passing of a ban on the burqa in Switzerland. And there've been uh, numerous other bans on the burqa uh, that are uh, ironic, um, uh, to say the least, uh, in the context of a pandemic when everybody is supposed to be wearing masks, uh, but uh, but there we are. So um, so these are this is the historical moment in which we are and in which Muslim women are often the um, at the forefront of an Islamophobic um, uh, at the and re in receipt of uh, Islamophobic hatred. Um, so speaking of those Muslim women, I'm going to talk about one of my very favorite uh, research participants. Uh, her name, I'm going to say, is Intasar. She was uh, Somali, Somali-American, and she was a junior in college at the time that uh, I was doing this research. Uh, when she first arrived in the United States as a young child, uh, and as a Somali refugee, she felt like a complete outsider. Remember, of course, uh, that um, a large number of refugees were driven from Somalia by a civil war um, preceded by Cold War rivalry for oil routes along the Persian Gulf. People tend to forget the role of uh, the United States and other powers in the destabilization of uh, Somalia. Siad Barre, the uh, repressive dictator, was heavily supported by the United States for many years and was provided military aid. So many of the stories of uh, uh, the people in my research actually have such uh, geopolitical uh, background. It's important to remember them, uh, that Islamophobia is not a, uh, an, simply an interpersonal thing, uh, that uh, these things have uh, in, um, have their roots in imperialism and they have their roots in uh, a geopolitics uh, that um, uh, uses the bodies of uh, black and brown people worldwide um, as fuel for um, a, cert a, uh, a quest for power. 
so uh, when Intasar first came to uh, the country, she felt like a complete outsider. Um, Somalia had this image, uh, as Ethiopia had the image of people who were just starving, and it was a very heavily maligned, this, this, this proud culture, this beautiful country, and they had this very maligned image of people who were either starving or they were pirates. And so you had like movies like Black Hawk Down and other uh, representations in the media, uh, and always in reference to the United States, always in reference to white people, um, how they were presented. So, so, uh, so Intasar went to school, she started playing basketball, and she discovered that she played really well. And this gave her immediate access to a cool and athletic community, a mostly African-American community, and a, a sort of a new persona and community that pushed her Muslimness and her Somaliness into the background. They were not invisible, but they were pushed into the background. Um, so, um, Rachel, if you would go to the next slide. Is that the correct one, Shabani? Yes. This is the one. Sorry, yes, this is the one. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so she started. She played uh, basketball really well, and this gave her access to this community. And basketball then became a kind of an indigenizing factor, a normalizing factor. It made her into uh, uh, an American. So she said, um, "You became like everyone else. You didn't have to be like a refugee. I could become part of this whole new community. I didn't feel like I had to say who I was, where I came from." Basketball Basketball defined me. It made everything easy. I wasn't some Somali outcast. And that's very sad to hear that she felt like she was an outcast. That word actually recurs in my research, that people uh, who um, um, grew up in this country felt like outcasts. I could just play basketball and be in Tassar, who plays basketball and who also happened to be Somali and Muslim when those things would at first define me. So in the words of uh, Irving Goffman, the sociologist, um, basketball here serves as a disidentifier. It's something that um, uh, establishes the other person as normal uh, and, and uh, pushes the stigmatized identity into the background. It downplays the other uh, identity. So the identities that she's attempting to um, push into the background are being Somali, being Muslim, uh, and so on. So the misogynoir that she's experiencing, uh, the racism uh, towards her as a black woman, as a Muslim, as a Somali, as somebody from uh, uh, this um, uh, country that is ravaged by civil war, uh, is she attempts to dissociate from it somewhat. And in the United States, you are probably aware that uh, sports and athletics have often been uh, kind of an ind indigenizing factor. This is also something that comes up uh, in other uh, populations, like uh, if you read uh, the book um, the Chosen by Chaim Potok, and at a very different historical period, uh, you find that European Jews use, used um, baseball in the same way. So, uh, so Intasar used basketball to find a community of athletic friends, uh, and so she found that it, this allowed her stigmatized identities to become somewhat secondary. Everyone knew that she was Somali and Muslim, but by playing basketball, she became part of this mostly African-American athletic community of practice. Now, don't get me wrong, Intasar was deeply proud of her faith and her background. The key factor here is that those identities would at first define her. They drowned her. She as a person, as Intasar, disappeared under the presence of Islam, conceptualized by the US media, by popular culture, and so on. So, um, so if you could go to the next uh, slide. Okay, great. Uh, so when Intasar turned 15, her mother, who was fairly traditional, uh, told her, you have to start wearing hijab. And then she said, now you have to stop playing basketball. You should have to become a more decorous uh, Somali Muslim woman. And Intasar complied a little resentfully, but she continued to play basketball while wearing hijab. And at this point, she found herself stuck between the expectations of her mother and her non-Muslim Peers. And both of these sets of expectations played into each other. So she says, suddenly my mom came out of no comes out of nowhere. You can't just be in Tassar, the normal person who plays basketball. You have to carry yourself in a traditional cultural way, which includes wearing hijab. So I got away with it for a year, playing basketball with hijab. 
uh, and it's really difficult to wear a hijab. Why? Not because it's difficult in itself, but because people assume certain traits that should go with hijab. You know, like you wear um, a black with uh, <laughs> red or something like that. Certain things go with other things, right? So what goes with hijab? Can you be a person who plays basketball and wear hijab at that time? No. It wasn't a thing. And even later, you and you find that the news media became were just less splashed with these stories of uh, women who played basketball and wore hijab, women who uh, were fashionable and wore hijab. And there was there was just this fascination, this consumption of these um, sensationalistic stories as if it was so strange for Muslim women to be breaking the myth and shattering the myth and becoming these things as if they were somehow trapped and they had to be rescued um, by uh, such stories. So she said the, um, the hardest thing for me to go to do was to go along with stereotypes like hijab and basketball. I thought it was a natural thing. So it wasn't weird at all for, uh, for Intasar. Um, so for her, uh, uh, actually, can you go back to the same one? The previous one, the previous slide. Yeah, there you go. So like hijab and basketball, I thought it was a natural thing. Uh, so she didn't see a conflict between them. But my non-Muslim friends thought, can you do this? How can you play basketball? Is this allowed? So people, uh, so non-Muslim friends, as well as her traditional mother, pressured her to perform a stereotypical Muslim woman who is not mobile, who is who doesn't do these things, uh, and who was basically reduced to uh, her faith and her culture. So now, um, and Tassar wasn't the only person to feel this way. And this uh, occurs as a theme throughout my book. Many of my participants felt very uncomfortable about being reduced to their faith. This happened often. So because of this, many Muslim undergraduate women tried to play down their religious lives when they were in public settings. So Tassar did that by means of basketball. Okay, so go to the next one. Um, and Intasar was when she was at college. Uh, she uh, she was uh, she joined a, a class on basketball, and she said at first they wouldn't pick me on their team. So they would look at her wearing hijab, a black woman, uh, and uh, Somali, and they wouldn't pick her. They would assume that she was not a good basketball player. Uh, so, but then not to brag, but I was good. Uh, so then she became known as this basketball playing hijab wearing woman. Uh, and some Muslims thought it was cute that I was hijabi and played basketball, but some of them gossiped about it. So it became a whole thing, right? And so this was really burdensome for her. So some of her Muslim girlfriends privately gossiped about how it was immodest to play this contact sport with boys and others admired her for breaking the mold. And so she said, I played, I kept my basketball thing undercover from both Muslims and non-Muslims. I got tired of this teaching role. I just wanted to be myself. She didn't want to be the amazing basketball playing Muslim woman or the bad, naughty basketball playing woman. So in Tassar, under this scrutiny and the amazement of both Muslim and non-Muslim peers just wilted and got increasingly tired of shattering this mold set for Muslim women by both groups. This is something Rachel just talked about, the surveillance, the cultural surveillance by both groups. Uh, so with the stigmatization of Muslim identity and also the stigmatization of Muslim women as being oppressed uh, and as being boxed in by these identities, then the stakes are higher within the community too. And you cannot shame the community. You cannot air any dirty laundry, no unofficial representation, right? So she she was she was it was she was she became uh, unsure about whether she should be doing this. Uh, would it destabilize the community? There's a war on terror going on. Is this even important? And so the intensity of surveillance on and by Muslims, especially of Muslim women's bodies, magnified the implications of Intasar's uh, playing of basketball. So she stopped. Intasar stopped playing basketball. And so she and she missed it a lot. And sometimes she would shoot hoops when she was by herself. Um, Americans like to say that you have the power to do whatever you want. Every Disney movie you, you watch will be about that theme, uh, that you have the power to be whoever you want to be. You should be 
uh, all you can be, uh, and you should break all molds, and you should be that individual who breaks out of family and community and so on. So my book examines some of the ways in which people are not free to be who they want and the things they do when they're not free. And some people, you know, when that when I talk to public audiences and they hear Inthasar's stories, they want to find her and they want her to tell tell her to go play ball, forget your mom, but she doesn't want to forget her mom because she wants basketball, she wants her mom, she wants her faith, and she wants her friends, but she is forced to choose uh, in a way that other women are not. So um, so these uh, identity options that are becoming almost cliche sometimes in their multiplicity uh, with changing identity backgrounds, but these options are not freely available to everyone. And people like Inthasar obviously are not the only people who try to fit in, who fail to fit in, who are being stereotyped, but we can use their example as a sort of model for people who engage with this, you know, uh, promise of a liberal, multicultural, diverse culture like college campuses and watch uh, what happened. Now, it is important to re realize that Inthasar wanted to have it easier, but she really wanted just to be herself. She didn't want to just be a Muslim. She didn't want to just be a refugee. She didn't want to abandon her Muslimness. She didn't want to abandon her Somaliness. And she was proud of her background and she was proud of the struggle that her family had undergone. She just didn't want to be always trapped in them and be defined by them. There's a difference between these things. So when she played basketball, that enabled her to cover her difference. But that's a struggle, that you have to cover something as if it's a dirty secret. Uh, and that is something that I find is, is defiling to identities when they are stigmatized and you are obligated to uh, to hide them, to cover them, uh, and to downplay them. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so um, if, could you go to the next slide? I think I actually uh, already just, that's right, okay. Okay, we can we can go to the next one. Okay, yes. So, um, uh, so we talked a little bit about Inthasar. I want to talk a little bit about my fieldwork, not too long. If you want more detail, you can go to the book. Uh, so the book is based on ethnographic research. No, go back to the the fieldwork. Um, my book is based on ethnographic research. Uh, that I conducted at two elite uh, university campuses. Uh, the And uh, this was not long after 9-11. I did participant observation with the Muslim student communities at these two campuses and more focused participant observation and in-depth interviews with 26 uh, primary female respondents in particular. Uh, uh, 13 at each of those campuses. Ethnogra ethnography is very intensive, very in-depth qualitative research. Um, and I'm sure you've uh, you've studied what, uh, what it entails. I was primarily interested in Muslim American women's identities on campus and how the campus environment facilitated and or inhibited their identity work. Um, by and large, we believe uh, that um, college campuses are places where you realize yourself or you discover yourself or you have the freedom to explore who you are and you have various options to explore who you are. But we find that in the case of uh, Muslim women, as well as many other um, students, this is not entirely uh, a, uh, this is a bit of a failed promise. Um, if you go, go to the next one. Uh, we um, uh, look at uh, college uh, through the, very often through the lens of media representations, uh, but also through the lens of how um, peer culture shapes the college experience. Peer culture is one of the most powerful factors in shaping the behavior of college students. You know, like professors like us like to pretend that uh, you know it's our courses that change your lives and so on, but it's really the other students on campus who make campus culture. Um, and since the, especially since the late 1960s or so, sociability and hedonism have grown more powerful and more ubiquitous uh, in higher education. Well, what happens when Muslim American students and second generation immigrants, many of whom grew up within religiously observant families, many of whom embrace uh, particular kinds of lifestyles, uh, cultural lifestyles, how do youth like this engage with the campus environment at what considers itself a big uh, party school. You know, if you go to the, uh, if you come to any campus in the United States, people regard themselves as, oh, we're a big party school, we're the biggest party school in the uh, United States. It's almost like a, a form of pride, uh, and everybody seems to regard themselves as being the biggest uh, party school ever. Um, now, um, uh, 
Um, the the thing uh, to also recognize, uh, if you go go to the next slide, that conformity is a key cultural practice for humans in their communities. And post adolescents and undergraduates are a special study in conformity. And camaraderie is very desperately important for emotional well being. We all know where we fit in, who accepts us, where we belong, and where these things don't happen. It's a visceral experience felt at the core of one's being. One of the biggest things that people want to know when they're going to college is, will I have friends, right? And especially when you're uh, living on, ca uh, on campus um, in dorms and you're not a day student. So when people are stigmatized, they're deprived of camaraderie or granted very shallow uh, connections. When you don't conform to uh, the mainstream norms or the dominant norms, when you're visibly different, uh, it is a lot harder for you in these supposedly diverse and liberal uh, cultures. Um, the uh, key factor here is visible difference. So you can be, if you downplay your religious identity and if it's not visible, uh, then you can make your uh, experience relatively positive. Um, but if you, for example, wear religiously identifiable clothing or you behave in uh, certain ways uh, that are identifiable as religious, that uh, puts you at risk further for um, uh, stigmatization uh, of your identities. Can you go to the next one, Rachel? Thank you. Uh, so um, Latifa was a was an Arab American uh, freshman, and she had just uh, come to college uh, after attending a mostly uh, a predominantly Muslim uh, high school. And uh, she says, uh, "Yeah, I came with some baggage. My whole approach to college is I'm starting on a new slate. So whatever I was taught in that home." is definitely not reinforced here. So everything she'd learned at home with her family, at her mosque, in her sort of larger um, uh, ethnic community uh, were identity possibilities that in campus spaces were now repackaged as baggage and they were blocked off in campus spaces. Um, uh, Latifa also talked about being uh, in classes like um, women in Islam and so on, uh, where she felt very uh, surveilled. She felt like she could not say anything because whenever people talked about oppressed Muslim women or women needing to be rescued, people looked at her because she was the one woman who was uh, wearing hijab. Uh, and the most, um, uh, I actually sat in on one of these classes and I noticed that the most um, uh, outspoken uh, people in the class were people who were not Muslim, um, who were talking about how terrible it was in Muslim context. So, uh, so the freedom uh, within self-consciously diverse uh, campus cultures was not a very meaningful commodity to Latifa. So in my book, I call attention to the marginalizing processes in campus social spaces that constrain Muslim women's identities and turn their home cultures into baggage. It's systemic. Right? The process is not just a glance or a mean word or something like that. It's the absence of representation very often in faculty and staff and curriculum materials in how academics are framed in the cultural demands to conform to Anglo uh, and secular ways to be normal, to fit in, to seek leadership and so on. Uh, so um, um, when you hear this thing about uh, home culture uh, being baggage, this also relates to a widespread belief uh, whether it's articulated or not in specific locations, that students who come to college really should cut off ties to their home communities, that you should explore and, and find uh, new uh, ways of living, new lifestyles, new ways of thinking, and so on. Uh, in, in, this is a long time back uh, that Vincent T Tinto, uh, a scholar of higher education, said uh, that there was still a belief that college students had to physically as well as socially dissociate from the communities of the past. Um, but today we do interrogate this belief, but there's still a common lingering notion that to be truly multicultural is to break with the ties that you had before, uh, especially, but especially if you're non-white and not Christian, right? Uh, and to try to find connections elsewhere. For the dominant majority for white Christian people, there's not the same expectation precisely because it's in the majority. So you can explore new cultures and clubs, but the nature of that ex exploration for a white Christian person is different 
due to the power differential. I talk a little bit more about this uh, in an article, uh, in a chapter I wrote for a book called Muslim Voices in School, uh, where I talk about how uh, the expectations of uh, engaging with diversity look very different depending on who you are. Uh, so um, um, how are we doing on time? I feel like I should probably conclude soon. Um, just yes, it's four forty, so um, that would be a good time to sort of summarise, and then we can yeah. open the floor to questions. Absolutely, yeah. I do want to make sure that we have uh, time for uh, for questions. So, uh, so yeah, we have a number of uh, um, quotes that I look at as well to explore why uh, in uh, the ways in which. Uh, Muslim women were interrogated if they wore hijab. They were asked why they wore hijab. If they did not wear hijab, they were asked why they didn't wear hijab. And so um, uh, part of the reason I use the stories of Muslim women is because, uh, um, you know, I, 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 I saw draw inspiration from Linda Tui Weiss Smith, who talks about uh, decolonizing methodologies, and that includes telling the stories uh, of uh, indigenous people, stories that are silenced in the noise of dominant voices. And a key way to silence people is to render them flat, uh, essentialized stereotypes, like unreal people that are always being depicted by other people in two dimensional ways. So my work is an attack on these essentializing images of Muslim women. There's no one, if you read my book, you're like, well, what exactly is a Muslim woman? Well, there's no one kind. Uh, and when you regard somebody as an object, your reality is defined by others. Uh, so Intasar, uh, for example, belongs to a community, a Somali community that's been under increasing scrutiny by law enforcement, by what, what you in Europe call prevent and we call uh, countering violent extremism, a very Islamophobic uh, set of programs uh, that uh, frame Muslims as always as a security uh, risk. So um, so really, uh, when we talk about visible difference, it raises the question, how do we treat people who aren't just like us? It's easy to congratulate ourselves for being nice to people who look and behave just like us, but how do we manage when they do not behave just like us? So for example, Switzerland just uh, passed this um, niqab ban. Uh, how do we think of ourselves? What does this reflect about how we think of ourselves and how we think uh, of the body politic? How do we think of the culture? How do we think of the humanity um, of others? So um, when we do ethnographic analysis, uh, we that reveals the cultural checkpoints that obstruct certain people from crossing over into normalcy uh, and to belonging. So um, yeah, so I think I'm gonna conclude right there and uh, um, we can take uh, questions that can uh, get to what people are thinking about. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Professor Mia. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone has any questions, can you use the little icon to raise your hand and I'll try and keep a note. Um, first, we've got um, uh, Tatsuma, um, if you'd like to open up your mic and ask your question. Mm -hmm. Okay, hello. Hi. Thank you for your fascinating presentation. It was uh, very interesting. And uh, um, I was wondering um, uh, if you compare uh, your ethnographic experience with the one presented by uh, Saba Mahmoud in her famous book on politics of piety, mm. when, uh, where she, she talks about uh, a different role of women in creating the uh, uh, agency and subjectivity in, in a new moral uh, landscape in Cairo. Uh, I mean, it's, it's strikingly different how uh, instead in, in your case, in the case you analyzed, mm -hmm. uh, and, and especially the basketball player, mm -hmm. but also the other ones, uh, women were not uh, able to, to actually carve a subjectivity and, and the form of agency uh, uh, for their for themselves uh, uh, using religious resources coming from Islam. So how would you relate to, to that book? Hmm. So, uh, so it's uh, uh, interesting that you asked that question. I was just uh, thinking about Saddam Mahmoud uh, and I was reading some articles uh, uh, commemorating her. Um, it's been, you know, a very short time since she passed and it, um, it was a great, great loss. Um, so Sabah Mahmoud, uh, in, I was reading this article by Kamran Asar Ali, 
who is a Pakistani American anthropologist, and he was talking about how um, uh, people sometimes regarded her as not a feminist uh, because of her representation. Uh, and she, he said, would uh, would respond, and she would say she was absolutely not um, uh, condoning any kind of injustice or any kind of oppression. But she was reminding people not to always see uh, people's possibilities in the context of liberalism, uh, that the agentic possibilities, the uh, the sort of the uh, the aggrandization of agency and choice. Uh, is not always what people seek, right? So, uh, so these religious women, uh, one might argue, are seeking submission, right? That in itself is agency. Uh, and so uh, the fact that it doesn't look like basketball is sort of immaterial, uh, but it is th what they seek, right? Uh, and this is this is really a struggle for me. I, I'm, I'm actually somebody who... Um, uh, I, I um, used to wear a niqab and burqa, uh, and at, this was in a Muslim majority context, and I was often opposed by Muslims because they said it was it was it was weird and it was not westernized and it was not modern and those and I, I opposed them and I I had to fight for it. So the fact that it was a burqa does that make it non-agentic, right? So, uh, so, so the, there are some um, questions uh, that it raises there, and um, but definitely Sabah Mahmoud goes much further uh, in that regard, uh, uh, saying that very often our commitment to liberalism will um, will presuppose what we uh, uh, what we predict that people should want. Whereas we should really do the ethnographic research and see what people want. And so that was really my goal uh, at, at this time. And uh, like after 9-11, I was hearing all these stories, these news stories about how the United States was going to be sending in troops to Afghanistan and they were going to save our sisters in blue, you know, the sisters in blue burqas and they were going to release them. And then they went there and they, uh, they put troops on the ground and all this killing and then the women wouldn't get out of their burqas. And they were like, what's happening? Why aren't you getting? And they were like, we need jobs. We need our husband's home. We need our families. Um, the burqa is just how we live, right? Uh, so it's like an imposition of um, sort of these foreign ideas of what it meant, uh, or what it meant to have the good, right? So yeah, so I, I hope that uh, that answers your question somewhat. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent. Has, um, have we got any uh, other questions? I don't see any particular hands up, so but do feel free to um, ask any. I think <laughs> I'll jump in. I'll take the opportunity yeah, go for to jump it. in now that I'm yeah. hosting. Actually, let me put my little camera on. Um, it's so interesting. I think this notion that um, of identities being drown drowning you, yeah. I think um, really what struck me, I certainly with my own experiences, is, yes. is that sense of tiredness yes. of having to be the face of a good Muslim or a moderate Muslim yes. and, um, and, and actively toning down my religiosity mm -hmm. in different contexts. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I won't wear a black hijab most right. of the time when right. I'm in, in the public or when I'm, I'm out and about because people associate that. With, yeah. with extreme religiosity and oppressiveness, right? Um, and yet, and and yet, I find a sense of relief in Muslim context, but then I also tone down my Westernization That's when right. I'm in a Muslim context. That's right. They won't understand my Australian egalitarianism and everything else like that. So, yeah. did did you find with your participants, yeah. um, was there much of a success in navigating spaces where they felt safe, where they felt they could be themselves, or were they always facing this bind? Yeah, you're right. This 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 was a constant struggle. I mean, these are. Um, uh, sort of the third spaces, I think, which you're thinking about, uh, where they create these these new spaces where they can be uh, um, uh, whoever they are. Uh, none of us is truly whoever we are. I mean, that's that's something we also recognize as anthropologists, sociologists. While we recognize our agency possibilities and so on, none of us is truly 
able, right, to, to be whoever we are, but we prioritize certain kinds of freedom over others. So, for example, if I have to, um, uh, I, I, I really dislike professional clothing, so jackets and stuff like that. I, I just find them very physically uncomfortable, uh, but I have to wear them in certain contexts, right? But uh, that is not regarded as something that's kind of an oppression and imposition. But if I wear a burqa, that's regarded as an oppression uh, and imposition. So, um, um, so I do find what you're talking about in terms of the struggle between these two kinds of uh, surveillance. Um, and uh, these young women would in their own spaces among themselves, uh, be much more tolerant and accepting uh, of these uh, um, uh, hybrid identities uh, than other than uh, non-Muslims or the sort of the uh, in in many cases their parents, for example, would be. Uh, and, and some of the key issues there uh, is that um, what you're talking about in terms of a sort of almost like a policing by the community uh, is something uh, that. Uh, if the people themselves were by themselves, they would engage in these behaviors also. But when they become a collective, then they almost feel like they have to uh, produce an official correct Islamic uh, representation uh, of 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 good model Muslim behavior. So let me let me give you an example. So um, okay, so. Uh, so like in a public event at a at a Muslim student association, which I guess for you guys would be Islamic societies, you know, at the and, uh, on campus, uh, they would um, uh, sort of uh, do sort of an exaggerated modesty between uh, the sort of uh, male and female students, where in their uh, otherwise in their everyday lives they wouldn't observe that. Uh, so there was almost like a production of official Muslimness going on and that was being policed uh as well so so there was almost this idea that the muslim the non-muslims expect to see this right and this wasn't like a like a, a pr properly articulated agenda but there was almost like this unconscious idea of the non-muslims expect to see this and when they see us doing high fives or you know um, engaging in these kinds of behaviors that they see as western or as non-muslim then they will get confused so we have to keep feeding them what they expect to see. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yes. Um, I, I, I always used to giggle a little bit when we'd go to an Islamic event on campus and you'd see the men in their, their galabiyas, but they had the, the folds because they'd just come out of the packets. You know, it's not, these were not clothing that they wore every day. You know, it was a production. That's um, right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's a young woman would say, "Oh, I go to uh, I go to the Juma prayer. I go to the Friday prayer, and I'm sitting uh, like just right ahead to this guy who uh, I saw at the nightclub last night." And I'm just like, "Okay." <laughs> exactly. Brother so, in the mosque, masculine, and it's that's like, right. dancing away to fifty cent in the nightclub. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. It's interesting because I think what certainly what's come out of my research in Australia is this notion, as you say, of a hybrid identity. Yeah. And where there were spaces for young Muslims to develop. Mm -hmm. In, in my case, a, an Australian Muslim identity, where yeah. they had the freedom to develop that, they seemed to be a lot they're more relaxed. They seemed also more able to um, take advantage of um, the opportunities that society would offer them and also had more strength to be more resilient in the face of the inevitable uh, discrimination that they would still experience. Yeah. But areas where there was a lot of scrutiny mm -hmm. on, you know, and almost a bifurcation, you couldn't be Muslim or you couldn't be, you had to either choose, you're either Muslim or you're Australian. There mm -hmm. was a lot less resilience and, and more tending towards marginalisation and possibly darker roots. Did you find um, something similar in America? I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, these kinds of things would definitely happen. I'm actually, you reminded me of a, a, a quote from uh, one of the young women who would say uh, that uh, when she first went to campus um, and she um, initially was, uh, uh, she had a lot of friends who would go to nightclubs. She wouldn't drink. She would go to nightclubs and she would, you know, dance, have a good time and everything. Uh, and, um, and then later uh, she wanted to become more religious and she realized that, um, it wasn't really possible to be in both uh, at the same time because people would push her away from this side and from the other side, right? And so she felt, she said, I felt like I had a foot in two different boats uh, and I was going to drown. 
um, because I couldn't stay entirely with this one and I couldn't stay entirely with that one. And it, she said that if I, uh, I, I don't want to wear hijab because then people will look at me like and I'm an outcast, right? And so then she said, eventually, I think she kind of gave up on the whole quote, quote unquote integration um, a project and she did start wearing hijab and she decided, you know, I just can have only one, mm, right? Yeah. You can have only one. Uh, so it's kind of like that you can't do that and it's it's hard, right? Um, I think that in, so, in some contexts it's harder than other, other contexts. Mm. It does depend. And I think this is where the role of campus, uh, uh, sort of um, how campus culture um, uh, sort of represents uh, Muslims, how how it's inclusive and so on. Um, uh, diversity culture, uh, you know, you, you, you've read, I'm sure you've read Sarah Ahmed, diversity culture has a lot of problems. Um, and so there are no easy answers to any of them. And any sort of um, project entails a what do you call it, uh, you know, like a sea change, like in the Tempest, like it's a cultural sea change. How is this uh, going to happen? Every every change is very um, like a spot clean. It's like a, like a, like a, bland, uh, like a Band-Aid. Uh, so most of these things are not really uh, properly addressing uh, a lot of the issue. And that's, you know, uh, Islamophobia uh, on a large scale uh, and particularly gendered Islamophobia. In this in this yeah. uh, because yeah. women end up being the targets most of all it's almost um, uh, more disappointing because if you move into an environment where you yeah. know you know that the prejudice is 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 outright you can deal yeah. with it but then when you have the promise of diversity and you have the promise of acceptance and you don't right. get it, it's almost it's worse. We, we actually have a question from um, Dr. Basandi. He's actually typed it in, but he's also raised his hand. Do you want me to read it out, um, Dr. Basandi, or do you want to open up your mic? Sorry, I was just having a bit of a, thanks, Shabana. That was that was really interesting. I was just wondering, uh, kind of, you know, bringing bringing your research or some of your observations and what you've seen in um, in the kind of U.S. campuses today. What would you say are kind of uh, have the debates, the discussions, have the issues changed? Where where is the 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 Muslim communities? Where are they today in terms of what 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 are, what are the big issues? Uh, would you say that they've they've shifted, or is it still uh, quite the same? No, I think a lot has shifted, um, and a lot has changed. It's unavoidable, right? Um, um, and that even even um, a few years after my research, when I went back to the uh, to the campus sites, I noticed that a lot has had changed, but a lot had also remained the same. So in terms of Islamophobia, a lot had remained the same, but the intensity of um, the discourse uh, that you have during a war, especially during the Iraq war, for instance, uh, that had uh, sort of lowered a little bit. The sort of the the intensity of it has, is is always higher when you're in a state of war, uh, or when when you're in a state of sort of having an administration like the Trump administration. So so the intensity of discourse always goes up during those times. Uh, but the other thing is that also that the uh, sort of the um, the resistance discourse also goes up, right? Uh, at uh, you know decent college campuses and in 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 many spaces the resistance discourse also goes up uh, and so you have found uh, we found that um, uh, since the Trump administration the uh, uh, extreme right wing uh, propaganda has gone up but also that has pushed the boundaries of where. Uh, sort of anti-Islamophobic and anti-bigotry, uh, and 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 uh, for example, uh, sort of the the growth of this uh, movement of Black Lives Matter has uh, has really blossomed, right? Um, uh, but it has still so far to go because we are looking at a you know, like I mentioned this before, we're looking at a resurgence of white nationalist discourse worldwide. Uh, this is not a small thing. This is a um, a large scale thing, and it promises. Uh, not just microaggressions, but violence and systemic harm uh, and sort of a move towards fascistic uh, control. So uh, so there's a lot uh, that needs to be done. What you mentioned in terms of communities, uh, in terms of some Muslim communities, for example, um, I think a lot has changed in terms of 
the the um, uh, the focus on mosques, right? So, uh, so mosques are not, uh, you probably you might have seen the film Unmasked. Uh, and and so more and more people are recognizing uh, that the uh, mosque community is actually quite small. The vast majority of Muslim Americans are not really, they're not mosque goers, right? Uh, and um, that uh, many of the mosque goers are actually fairly alienated from uh, uh, mosque establishments as well. Uh, and that um, uh, many, uh, sort of um, uh, researchers and uh, theorists on of Muslim communities are finding that um, people are turning more and more to a shopping for um, leadership uh, uh, on a sort of a piecemeal basis. So people aren't like joining groups necessarily wholesale, but they're shopping for an opinion here, an opinion there, that kind of thing. So, uh, so um, in terms of um the influence of particular groups i think that's going to change things uh it's going to change also the fluidity of how people identify themselves Shivana, um, could, I just ask to... one, could i just ask one very brief because i know we're a bit running out of time here I'm just, I'm just bringing it here to campus here at ucc you mm -hmm. know like one of the you know we're, we're kind of you know i'm the the co-chair of the race equality yeah. We do a lot of on equality, diversity, and inclusion. Yeah. We want to, you know, reach out and, and work with minorities, not just Muslims, with all minorities on campus and you know, majorities, whatever that means. And I'm not yeah. trying to create any. But what, what kind of advice would you give? You know, as we're kind of navigating this, where you know, issues of race, issue, issues of religion on campus are are you know becoming, I think, yeah. more more kind of focused here, in particular yeah. in Ireland. So if there's any advice that you would give as we kind yeah. of navigate through this, what would it be? Yeah. So the first thing that I really have started to believe in more and more is solidarities among uh, sort of uh, racial, ethnic, uh, uh, gender groups, sexual minority. I think that the uh, solidarities, uh, the that aspect has really grown uh, in the United States. So, so uh, when people used to think of themselves as being in bubbles of communities and they were all by themselves and and nobody else was coming to help them, I think that has really changed. Uh, and I think solidarities, the growth and the building of solidarities, is really important um, uh, because the people in power are not coming to help us. <laughs> you don't recognize that worldwide. Nobody in power is giving up their privilege, right? Nobody in power is going to voluntarily give up any privilege. It's not going to happen. It's never happened, right? You can't persuade people into giving up privilege. Uh, that solidarity is the only way. Solidarity uh, and the growth of movements uh, of the oppressed and of the marginalized is the, really the only way to go. And then people sometimes will ask me, well, how do I, I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know how to relate to people. I feel afraid of offending people, for example. And my number one uh, sort of response is always just listen. Just listen to people for a change, right? Because that's been our big problem. People don't listen to others when they tell their stories, right? And the people always there is this imposition of stories, imposition of interpretations, and a telling of what we're going to do next. So just listen, I think, is a key. Uh, so if you can create context where people will listen to each other, I think that goes a long way. Um, I do want to thank Dr. Desondi for asking that question because yeah. it was a much more optimistic note than the rise of far right um, power, yes. which is is, yes. is gloomy but um, a real warning to us. Very but really. Knowing that your advice about um, building those links of solidarity and reaching out and listening, um, I think, is really key. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you again on behalf of the study of religions and the women's studies departments here at UCC. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us. It's thank been you. a very interesting lecture. I've got some thank yous in the comments of people who unfortunately had to leave um, because they've got teaching commitments. But thank you, everybody, for attending too. Um, and we welcome you and thank you so much and hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your, your day in Chicago and to everyone else here um, visiting. Thank you so much. It's been thank wonderful. You. Thank you for having me. Thank you.